I want to talk about the approach um, while we're on Sister Sledge, the approach to the Sister Sledge project, and then the approach that happened later with the Diana Ross, Diana album in 1980. It seemed to be a different approach. And, and what I mean by that is that, at least in Diana's case, it seemed as if you were there to tell her story. In other words, um, it seemed like there was more time invested in finding out you know, who she was, what she wanted to say, um, whereas in Sister Sledge, it didn't seem to be that kind of thing. It's like, we're, you know, we have an idea, but it's not, it's not necessarily Sister Sledge's story. That's right. You, yeah. you, you got it right on the money. Yeah. Yeah, you've read the book, that's for sure. Yes. In, <laughs> in with Sister Sledge's case, we told their story. We told them what their story was. In Diana Ross's case, we interviewed her quite extensively, and from those from that interview, um, we put together what Diana's actual real story would be, from our point of view. By the way, I mean it wasn't her point of view; it was our point of view. But they were her words and ideas, if you will. Mm-hmm. So, um, and and that's because we didn't want to repeat the same problems that we had with Sister Sledge because we love Sister Sledge. It's just that that's the only way we knew how to work was our way. You do mm-hmm. our songs our way because we've written those songs for you. They're actually your songs, but you know, but we did them, so this is how they go. With right. Diana, we wanted to make the songs hers. We wanted her to love them, and we wanted her to embrace them, but we wanted her to understand that we were making her next record, not her last record. Mm-hmm. So this was the Diana Ross of the future. Um, so after we interviewed her, all of those concepts, all those sort of future concepts, which actually wound up becoming the Diana Ross that we now know and love, were her thoughts. That's what she said to us. But when we wrote things like I'm coming out and, you know, and upside down, and, you know, we had known about the the whole affair with Barry Gordy and all that kind of stuff. We knew about it, but it wasn't public knowledge then. So we talked about it in a very sly, clever way by going upside down, you're turning me. You know, we, we knew that. Yeah. We we interviewed her extensively, and the big problem we had with Diana was with the song "I'm Coming Out," because uh, you know I got that original idea because I went to a gay club. It was a, 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 a I call it a transvestite club, but it probably wasn't. But it was frequented frequented by a lot of transvestites because it was one of those clubs in New York around the time where everybody went to everybody else's club. Mm-hmm. So I just happened to be in the bathroom. And I noticed that there were a bunch of Diana Ross impersonators in the bathroom with me at the exact same time. And the moment was so peculiar and so bizarre that I got the idea um, to write, I'm coming out. I thought, man, you know, the gay community looks at Diana Ross as a diva, a god almost. And I thought, what if she took their big rallying cry, their catchphrase, and turned it into a hook? Mm-hmm. What if, you know, because chic songs are novelty songs. I mean, we write hooky novelty songs, even though people don't want to admit it. They want to try that. They want to try and say, you know, we're these heavy artists doing this. And I go, yeah, we are that, but we're very aware of the culture, and we're trying to write songs that represent the here and now or the future, whenever the record would come out. Mm-hmm. So I'm coming out because of my political background and blah, 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 and because of, you know, Diana Ross's um you know, obvious huge gay following just seemed like the perfect hook. And also a a common practice with R&B acts in those days was to have a song that we used to call our coming out song, which means the song that you start your show with. It doesn't mean that you're coming out of the closet. It means you're coming out on stage. (laughs) So it was like, it was a perfect chic lyric. It it was just letter perfect. There was nothing wrong with it because every chic album has what we call a coming out song. Um, On one album, the coming out song is called Open Up. On the other album, it's called Chic Cheer. On the first album, it's called Strike Up the Band. And those coming out songs are your new album and the song you're going to start the show with, the song you're going to come out with. It was all so nice and neatly wrapped. We didn't believe that there would be any problem for anybody. But uh-huh. there was. So we'll, yeah, we'll... Diana Ross played the record for Frankie Crocker, who was the number one DJ in America. And Frankie said, uh, Diana, this record's going to ruin your career. Do you, People are going to think that you're gay and that you're coming out of the closet. And she didn't even know what coming out of the closet meant. And, he's, and then he explained it to her, and she confronted us in the studio. 
And it really is the only time in my life that I've ever lied to an artist. She looked me in the face and says, Niall, is this a gay song? Are people going to think that I'm gay? Are they going to think that this is like me coming out and telling the world that I'm gay? And I looked her right in the face and says, Diana, what are you talking about? That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. Who would think that you are the queen? You are a sex goddess. <laughs> like, how would you, who said that to you? Well, Frankie cried, oh, well, Frankie is nuts. I don't even know what he's talking about, you know. So um, we well, denied it. And, um, and then Motown decided they were not going to put the record out. And uh, the record sat on a shelf for a long time. We initiated a lawsuit and all sorts of things. It got really ugly. Finally, they did a remix, which if you hear the original now, which both versions are available, you can see that the remix is not far from what we did and mm-hmm. actually, for the most part, doesn't sound as good, but the songs are there. And, then, you know, so they put that out, and next thing you know, record shot right to the top of the charts. Well, why didn't you just tell her the truth? Because that seemed to me um, probably something that she would be able, I, I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't assume, but I'm assuming at this point, she's, you know, since she's a huge star, that she's aware, um, particularly during that time that she had this gay following, um, why not just say this is a song to you know, address your gay fans? Because she came to us concerned right <laughs> if she hadn't she, hadn't she just wanted us, to avoid she didn't want to she didn't want that gay connotation at all in any kind of way i i can't read her mind right, i'm just yeah. saying that she came to me concerned yeah. and because she was concerned i was thinking like wow why is she keying off of that why can't she key off the part that we're talking about key off it being the opening of your show yeah, yeah. and if you notice i don't know if you've ever seen diana ross but that's how she opens her show She's yeah. opened it almost after that record became a hit. She changed her show around, and it hasn't changed since. She <laughs> opens the song with "I'm coming out." <laughs> so eventually, she kind of got what? Well, she kind of got that, even though that was kind of the lie. <laughs> she kind of got what? The the fact that 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 could be used as an opening to. No, no, no. Song. That wasn't. No, you got the story wrong. No, that wasn't a lie. I'm saying that that both meanings were correct. Both things were correct. We wrote that as her opening up song. Mm -hmm. In other words, we figured that she, like every other band, right, she, like every other artist, her new show would be basically her brand new album. I'm I'm not sure how old you are, but let me explain something. In the old days, when you went to see an artist do a a live show, that live show was pretty much songs you didn't know because they were all from the new record, and then you wait to the end of the show, and then they play all of their hits. Okay. Like that was a typical show in the old days. Like yeah. If you went to see the Jackson 5, you'd, you'd hear all new songs, and then at the end you'd hear you know, whatever their last three albums were, mm-hmm. those big singles. But every artist, their new show was always the new album. That was the show. And um, so Diana Ross was no different. Chic was no different. When you went to see Chic, our new show was would be our current record, and then by the time we get to the end, then we'd play you know, uh, La Freak and I Want Your Love and Dance, Dance, Dance and Everybody Dance. But yeah. the new show would start out with, like when we did, uh, when we started uh, the show and we were doing Good Times, well, that show would start with, uh, you know, with the instrumental open up. Uh, and, you know, and, and then, um, you know, or Chic Cheer or something like that. Yeah. So that that's how it would work. So what we said to her was was half true. The only part that we denied was that was that we were thinking about the gay audience. Right. So um, you know we were like, no, 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 Diana, this is your song to open the show with. This is the op- this is the open up song. That's why you say you're coming out. You come out with this record. This is your coming out song. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and and we even explained it to her so so honestly. This part was honest. We said, look, Diana. We think of you, and this was 100% true. We said, we think of you as royalty. We think of you as the queen. They call Aretha the queen of soul. But, you know, Diana, you're the queen of, like, sort of pop R&B. You are that person. Mm -hmm. So just like the president of the United States walks into the room and they play Hail to the Chief, Da 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 da. da. We right. go, ladies and gentlemen. Da 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 da. It was a fanfare. Yeah. It was a fanfare to Diana Ross, and it was the beginning of her show. Yeah. That song I'm coming out was the beginning of her next show, and that's what it's written as. It's written as pop, 
And if you go back and you look at Sikh shows in the old days, we would hide. We wouldn't come out right away. We would start playing because we had wireless guitar rigs, and in those days not many people had them. And we'd start playing, and you'd hear the music being played, and then we'd walk out on stage. So that was our concept for Diana Ross's show. She would sing, I'm boom, boom, bum, bum, coming, boom, boom, bop, bum, out from backstage, and the crowd would go crazy, and then the horns would blow, da 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 and then she'd make her big grand entrance. We had the whole thing thought out, which is now how she does it. That's exactly yeah. what she does now. Now, years later, you would uh, work with her again on the Working Overtime album. Uh, what was that? Was that a more um, pleasant experience? Yeah, that was great. I mean, so now I'm, you know, with her, and I'm sitting on the biggest record of her life. It gave her financial independence. It gave her independence from Motown. After that album, she left Motown and signed a big deal with RCA. And then when we did work in overtime, that was Motown wooing her back and giving her an executive vice presidency, mm. along with a lot of money. She was thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> In your book, you talk in detail about working with uh, David Bowie on his Let's Dance album and, and Madonna on uh, her Like, like a, Virgin a Virgin album, yeah. and you know, and and work with Duran Duran and a host of others too numerous to mention uh, would also follow. Um, which of your many accomplishments gave you the greatest personal satisfaction? Um, I, I would think you know all of those are huge. Um, if you notice the the style that that the book takes, the sort of narrative style of the book, the 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 records that I concentrate on are the records that my life was one way before those records, and another way after. Uh -huh. So so I would say that even though all those records and all those artists really changed my life. The, the record that changed my life the most, even though it didn't sell the most, it changed my life the most, was David Bowie's Let's Dance. Uh -huh. Because prior to that, um, the only big star that we had ever worked with was Diana Ross. Right. Um, so to do Let's Dance was huge, and David was a white rock star, and blah, blah, blah. And um, it was uncharted territory in a way, because, um, you know, it, it just was. I mean, as tough as Diana was, that's how easy David was. He was the exact opposite. Everything went great. We didn't have any record company to answer to. David paid for the record himself. He hired me himself, had nothing to do with any exec. Uh -huh. And we did the record in 17 days, start to finish. And it was an incredible experience. And the record was so powerful, it was the biggest selling album of his life, some people that only have one Bowie record, that's the one that's they the have. One they have. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and after I had six flops in a row, this record made me hot, and it put me in a position to then go on and do all of those other artists that you mentioned, In Excess, Duran Duran, um, you know, uh, Madonna, biggest record of my life is Like a Virgin. That album is, you know, you know yeah, Let's Dance was in the double-digit millions, but I think... Uh, Madonna maybe double the sales of I think Madonna's probably over twenty something million now, mm -hmm. twenty five. So Madonna's in that like a Virgin album is in that upper stratosphere of big gigantic albums like Thriller, mm -hmm. Saturday Night Fever, uh, Fleetwood Max Rumors, you know that that mega stuff, twenty million, you know that that sort of thing. Right. Your your book also talks a bit about. Um the racial divide within the, the music industry. Uh, and what I mean by that, you, you do talk about how there doesn't seem to be a, a black equivalent of an Elton John or even a David Bowie, as we were just talking about. Um, do you think the fact that you, in Bowie's case, in, in that particular album, do you think the fact that he was white and, and had that audience that it sort of gave you more legitimacy in the eyes of other people in the industry? Well, what? Uh, yes, I, I do believe that because you could tell by the records that I got after that. Mm -hmm. But um, but the, the, the thing that uh, I was hoping that Bowie's record would give me was prior to Bowie, I was just considered a disco producer. And, and I just wanted to just be considered a producer. Right. Uh, you know, Quincy Jones is just considered a producer. You would call him for anything. Right. Um, that's what I wanted to be, was the producer to be called for anything. 
And that's what David helped me achieve because by doing that and then going to In Excess and going to Duran Duran, I mean, really Duran Duran helped me a lot with that because, you know, a lot of people realize uh, that, and I'm not being egotistical, I'm really, I love these guys, they're my buddies, um, but a lot of people realize that, uh, you know, I rescued them, and they even say it, that, you know, uh, their biggest record, um, The Reflex, was from an album that was already finished and done, mm-hmm. already off the charts over, and I came in and I reworked the thing and gave it new life, and it sold more singles than Rio or any of the other big records that they've had, Um and and it was a once again it was a real issue about race because the record company didn't want them to put the record out because they said it sounded too black. Well, once I sound, made Duran Duran sound black, they sold more records than they ever sold. <laughs> yeah, so right. you know it's like I mean if you if that's what you want to call it, if you if I made them sound black if that's the definition, right? Then sounding black was exactly what they wanted, and it was exactly what the fans wanted. No, no fans never said, "Well, I'm never going to buy that Duran record because it sounds too black." It was only the executives that said that. Right. And if you listen to Madonna, if you go on YouTube and listen to her interviews, she says it right plain up from front. She says, "Oh, the reason why I'm working with Nile because he's a complete musician and he has that R&B thing. He's got that black sound that I really want." Mm-hmm. She says it yeah. right there, clear as a bell. She says it over and over again, and just puts it right in the face of the industry. Like <laughs> he's got that black sound that I really want. Um, you wear many hats: composer, arranger, guitarist, producer, performer. Uh, you you have all of those talents. And which of those do you shine best? Um, it's hard for me to look at myself and, and and be honest about it. But I know that the one that I like doing the most is just playing guitar. Mm-hmm. Because when you play guitar, um, it's pretty much the same system that I was brought up in, like at the Apollo Theater, it's like, uh, you know, it's like the Coliseum, either thumbs up or thumbs down, you sink or swim, live or die, right there on the spot, and when I'm playing guitar, I don't know the song, Um, I'm walking into a brand new situation, and I have to make people happy right there on the spot. Um, because if I don't, that means when I leave, they're going to get somebody else to come in yeah. and fix it. And I know that, so I'm trying to make it great. I love the pressure of of responding to a problem right there on the spot. Um, so that that's what I think I, I like the best. I, I just played uh, with uh, Adam Lambert. And, uh, right, I, I heard I just, about that. Yeah, and I just came in. He, he hit me on, like, Twitter. <laughs> and I and I just said okay, book a studio, and I ran into the studio and just went in and started playing. And I said, you know what, Adam, here's what I'm gonna do, bro. I'm gonna do this the same way we used to do it in the old school. That every one of those records that I played on, there were multiple guitar players, even bands that were known for being um, like if they had a guitar player or two in the band, they would still supplement those records with studio musicians because after. Um, you know, after the wall of sound was created, so to speak, Mm -hmm. people started realizing that you needed those layers of music to make, you know, recorded music more palatable. So, um, you know, I said to Adam, I'm going to go, I'm going to do your record like old school. I'm going to play like three or four parts that work together with all that music you have on your record, just like I did on a Britney Spears record, just like I did on a Mariah Carey record. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I, and I played it like that. I was thrilled, had more fun than you can imagine. And that's what I did on Michael Jackson on History, same thing. But Michael was ex- expects that kind of stuff. See, he grew up with that, so right. he, he knows it. Whereas Adam didn't realize, like, wow, really, that's how you guys do it? I said, yeah, yeah. three, four guitar players on some records. 